Mood Indigo. Hi, this is Carl Weintrack with the Daily Music Break at www.dailymusicbreak.com. Welcome to our inaugural uh, video chat, and we're talking with Jeff Clawson. Jeff is an Associate Professor of Harmony at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. We're going to speak today about Duke Ellington, uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to say that, that Jeff has performed with Bob Brookmeyer, Paquito de Rivera, George Russell, Gunther Schuller, uh, Artie Schoen, I'm sure plenty of other uh, great people, but these are some of the, the highest names that he's performed with. So first of all, Jeff, welcome, and thank you very, very much for taking time out. Yeah, thanks. thanks for having me, Carl. I really appreciate it. Look, look forward to talking with you today. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much. Um, to start with, in looking over your, uh, you know, your page at the website at Berkeley, you're both a performer uh, and te you know, teacher of music, actual technical music. You teach people how to play, you teach people um, you know, all, all the technical elements, and you get into some of the cultural elements as well. Is that, first of all, is that rare? Do a lot of uh, professors and associate professors do that? Or is that something that's kind of unique? And um, how does that relate maybe to Duke Ellington? Well, you know, I don't know I don't know the rarity of it, but I, um, I do like to teach in a number of departments across the college um, because I believe as a musician, that's an important part of, of what I do and how I perceive and what my perspective is in the music that I play. Um, I like teaching students and discussing with students the ideas of being a creative individual, um, having some insight into um, what it is that you're performing, who you're playing with. Um, I think understanding some of the history along the way um, is important, while at the same time understanding the rules that come along with it um, mm -hmm. in terms of, and I, I actually hesitate using rules, I'll say, how do we hear things? How do we, mm -hmm. how do we create and express based upon a common practice tradition? But um, I, I like it all. I think a performer should also be naturally a, com a composer, a creator, an improviser, a conductor. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost a philosopher sometimes as well to be able to get discussions and be able to get um, get real you know creative uh, you know creative brainstorms going with their mm -hmm. other fellow musicians. So it's not just it's not just the music. It's not just knowing which notes to play at a particular point in time. No, no. Mm -hmm. exactly. And ha this seems like it would work in well with the discussion of Duke Ellington because Duke Ellington is important historically, and I'm sure laid the groundwork for a lot of, just like Einstein led, laid the groundwork for a lot of things that people, you know, uh, scientists study today. How, how, does, how does Duke play into what, what you just said? <laughs> well, uh, consider, and I'll, I'll approach students like this. I mean, I'll say, so imagine a musician that you enjoy playing with, that understands you, and how long have you played with them? And students at the college level might have, you know, two to three years. It's rare if you can get some, oh, five years. There's a bassist I play with and we, we're best friends. But when I tell them that Ellington ran a band for 50 years, they have to consider this, this idea of what does that mean? And it's more than just understanding someone's musical identity, um, but it's, it's understanding First off, how do you run a band? How do you deal with all the personalities? How do you deal with um, respecting your musicians so they respect you and want to play for you? How do you treat them well and pay them well? And I see over the 50 years that this is something um, that Ellington was, was able to do when other band leaders um, had to you know, close or um, break up the band or have a smaller band. Um, mm -hmm. And this was something that he was able to do for a long period of time, not just um, 
looking and adapting to how he could be maybe considered more relevant in certain eras of the music, basically a jazz history through, you know, Ellington's life, mm -hmm. but how he could keep his band working. And that's huge. And that takes a lot of, um, you know, a lot of that uh, sort of understanding what's, what's going on with the fellow musicians, understanding what's going on with the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were even moments where I know they were working, he had the band working, doing ice skating shows or where he was doing, um, you know, he was doing a, a little short feature. I think it was, I think it was Universal, was it? Where he, he was with an animated stop motion puppet, like Puppetoons, the Puppet Pal mm -hmm. guy um, that used mm -hmm. to do those old Saturday morning um, shows. But he, he really did a lot of stuff to keep the band working, trying mm -hmm. to consider different audiences, different types of people that might find, might find what the band was doing interesting. So, so and I'm diverging from the questions I have, which is always uh, not a good idea, but it was different uh, from, from Louis Armstrong, who's, you know, when you talk about the giants of that era, that's probably, that's probably the list at the very top. You know, other people came later, but, but Louis more or less gave his career over to Joe Glazer, and he just went and played. So, so that's a that's a I guess a key differentiation between the two. Well, and, and I, yes, perhaps I, I do think that the for both Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, I, I do think that the the public perception and mm -hmm. audience viewing and, and just in American music, um, they're they're icons, and I think that was for you know quite a bit this unblemished image of something that really mm -hmm. stood for you know, for, for, for greatness and quality. And I mm -hmm. think that that's something that definitely Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong had in mind, but definitely mm -hmm. Duke went through a variety of, um, you know, started with Irving Mills and went to the Morris Agency and ended up, you know, going through different labels and record companies and, and trying to figure out and navigate mm -hmm. you know, leading, a, leading a band for so long. Mm -hmm. To get back to my list of questions, and I, I, I tricked you because I told you questions I was going to ask, and then when and I always do that. No, that was great. What, what to a, to a non-musician, and maybe someone younger today, everybody's heard the name Duke Ellington. What, what, what to you, though, is the essence of why Duke Ellington is important today? Why is he a giant? I think this is a this is a kind of a loaded question. A lot of mm -hmm. ways to go with this. Um, I, I think Ellington really understood the idea of collaboration, and um, by collaborating and, and involving himself with so many musicians, um, he was able to really tap into music in a way, um, especially with so many musicians on stage together, in a way that really people hadn't heard before in a way that was able to change and able to take the personalities um, of the band and sort of evolve over time as, um, as music changed and people's, you know, perceptions of, of concerts and, um, and TV and, and movies and film changed. Um, I think the collaborative efforts were, were huge for him. I think this is something that um, always kept him changing and being honest to the era in which he was living. Right versus being very stuck in an old school sound or a very traditional big band if, um, flavor. If it, what I hear you say, please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is fascinating in that he was a genius at handling his band and keeping the band, you know, keeping all these creative geniuses he worked with, uh, you know, satisfied enough that they stayed with the band. And also at the same time, he was almost helping to architect music going forward, jazz going forward and how it fit into society. And it almost like a, a, a combination of the two that he was that he was almost like a presence in, in a sense. Yeah, I think so. And it's <laughs> and you said it best, you know, having the, the guys stay in the band because they wanted right. to a number of them did leave and came back. Right. Um, you know, Johnny Hodges left um, for a few years and right. decided it was you know, there was it's a lot to it. And he came back. Cootie Williams left, came back. Um, a lot of members, you know, kind of even some of the stars at one point yeah. left and came back. There were times when 
musicians who thought in the collaborative process that Duke Ellington owed them some money, you know, Johnny Hodges might do this, like money sign when they play a song like, hey, this is my idea, you know, and, uh -huh. uh, and he was known for this. Right. And, and Clark Terry um, in an interview was quoted as saying that he, you know, he, Clark Terry acknowledged this, that Ellington, you know, had, had took these ideas from Barney Begard and Cootie Williams or Johnny Hodges and, Clark Terry goes on to say, yeah, but these guys would have never made it into what Ellington made it into. It would have just been their warm-up exercise or a little melody that they played. Um, so in that sense, yes, the collaborative effort was, it was brilliant. And it was that, you know, I think it has that idea of, um, you know, if you want to use the, you know, genius, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I think mm -hmm. it's and it, who, who was just, uh, just if you could, Briefly say who Johnny Hodges was and how important he was in this whole landscape of Duke Ellington. Oh, and he was, first off, he was the highest paid musician in the band. Mm -hmm. he, um, he was actually a Boston guy, friends with Harry Carney. And Harry Carney, um, one of Duke's oldest band, band members um, you know, from the beginning, ended up having uh, Johnny Hodges come in the band. Duke loved him. And... Uh, Johnny Hodges is the, is the type of player that um, isn't just an alto player. And he didn't always play lead alto. It was, you know, there were times where he was um, often just in the section, but his solos were always uh, just these beautiful um, breathing life into these melodic phrases, almost yeah. voice like with the smears and the vibrato. And he was one of the stars. People would go to hear the Duke Ellington band to be able to see and to hear Johnny Hodges who played these lines that, sometimes just would tug at your heartstrings emotionally um, that can't be written down you can look mm -hmm. at notes on a page oh here's johnny hodges you know a transcription of a solo but you can't possibly understand how an alto sax can sound like that until you hear okay who's billy strayhorn jeff well <laughs> billy strayhorn was probably the biggest collaborator with ellington and there's a lot of discussion about how much Strayhorn wrote, how much Ellington wrote, how much was collaborative. Um, did Ellington put his name on, on music where he had a very small hand in? Um, the idea here is that um, as, I've, as I've read, um, Strayhorn knew Ellington's music so well that he was actually able to, in, you know, backstage in the green room, perform I think it was maybe sophisticated lady perform it exactly the way that Ellington had on stage and then show. And if it were me, I would do it like this. And Strayhorn played it and Ellington that got Ellington's attention was like, wow, this is, this is, you know, this young guy is pretty amazing. And he was classically trained. He had studied, um, he had studied music um, in a traditional sense. He knew Ellington's style. He was able to, um, able to work under conditions where Ellington might be calling him on the road and, and give him really fast, really quick deadlines. Um, I don't know. I don't know how familiar um, you are with, with lush life or the background. But right. those are, you know, for a young, um, you know, young man to be writing lyrics with such depth and mm -hmm. such, such harmonic interest um, shows you know, Strayhorn on his own. And that's just one of many examples. And Daydream actually tends, is one of my favorites of his. Mm -hmm. But um, you tend to find his harmonic language quite advanced, and I think, and melodic language quite advanced. And I think that would have been a good, a good inspiration to Ellington along the way. Um, mm -hmm. Ellington was obviously the big, the big icon, the star. Right. A lot of the time, Strayhorn would sort of, sort of fall into the back. And um, I'm glad that people are paying attention to Strayhorn. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you, the Hodgdews, um, David Hodgdews, if I'm saying Hodgdew correctly, but his, his biography on Ellington, on um, Strayhorn, excuse me, called Lush Life is, is amazing. Um, and it talks about, you know, there were some frustrations Strayhorn had. I was going to ask you whether they had a personal relationship. Now, Strayhorn was openly living as a gay man at that point. Is that, and that back then is, you know, really something. And Ellington obviously was this huge media star. So it must have been an interesting dynamic. Were, were they close personally? 
they were. I mean, by all by all counts, and I don't know the, um, I don't I don't know any any precise or specific um, discussions about um, how close, but I do know that Lena Horn, who was good friends with Strayhorn, um, has has mentioned that there was a certain chauvinistic nature to Ellington that he would. Um, he would treat Strayhorn sometimes this way. And I, I don't have the exact quote. Um, Strayhorn's nickname for, I mean, excuse me, Ellington's nickname for Strayhorn was Sweet Pea, mm -hmm. which says something about the relationship. It wasn't Tiger or, right. or um, you know, um, so, you know, Little Lion or something. It was, it was the idea that um, I think, you know, there was a certain maybe power and authority that Ellington had um, as to any, any closer nature of that I haven't in my research seen or, or read. Um, mm -hmm. He seemed to be as a, as an openly gay um, African American musician and artist. And um, he seemed to be very accepted for that. Mm -hmm. I think if anything in the band, when bands, the band had issue, it was more a matter of, of just musical jealousy and the ideas like, man, who is this guy? He plays piano and he's a composer. Duke Ellington's a piano and composer. Why is this guy always coming around? Mm. Why is he? But so I think <laughs> those types of jealousies were just inherent in the nature of the competition in the band. I guess, I guess it helps to be a genius if you're going to, you know, <laughs> probably helps a lot. And as an outsider, I, I've noticed that um, there are the three minute, four minute songs that. Ellington, you know, take the A train, and I, I love the story about how the take the A train, the lyrics to take the A train, and the uh, the, the title of the song, which maybe um, real quickly. My understanding is that Strayhorn came to Ellington and said, "I want to associate with you," and Ellington uh, said, "Write a song and bring it to me," and he gave him the directions to his apartment, and. And Strayhorn couldn't think of a name for the song, and he took the first line of the directions, which was "Take the A Train." Is that, that true? Yeah, that's, that's yep. That's that's the story. Yeah, it's it's uh, a riot. <laughs> um, but to get back to my question, I sense that there's the short pieces like "Take the A Train" uh, that are three minutes, which I guess was a record back then, and then there were the more longer symphonic type pieces. Is that true that there was a dichotomy? Was that rare at that time? And with a three-part question, and were the um, way he did it very different between the two? Or was one just longer than the other? Yeah. No, that's a, that's well, a I thoroughly question. confused you with three. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that he, he was dealing with, you know, coming from the Cotton Club, um, he was dealing with uh, a very, you know, everyday set where he'd have to play or sets where he'd have to play in a band where he's writing the short, um, kind of the popular numbers that you're talking about. He's also working with dancers and doing choreography and having to learn this stuff quickly. And at the same time, um, he's considering that within this, there, there is a certain restriction um, to what he can do and the record length. There's a certain restriction and right. Creole Rhapsody, I always sort of has a, as a marker for one of his first extended works, which um, was in 1931, I believe just right around the time he's leaving or has left the Cotton Club. And it was two sides, part one and part two. And the interesting part about it is you have the A side and then the B side. And it's basically a lot of playing around at the blues form, which he liked to and you go to the B side and almost as to be expected on the B side of an album, you see a lot more of uh, sort of taking these chances. He has the trombones playing in five bar phrases where in, in blues, you know, we're looking at phrases of four. So we have eight or 12 and he has the trombones playing in five bar phrases. He has a, a little drum solo at the end. He has a trumpet break where the trumpet actually turns the beat around in the break and then comes back in and everyone plays with these quirky little elements. And mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't put any of the, what would have been called jungle music, um, the growling trumpets, none of that was in this, this first extended work. I think this was trying to have a new association and trying to sort of extend his, 
you know, extend the colors on his palette without having to resort to what his band of the Cotton Club was so used to. This is just my opinion. Mm -hmm. you know, but you can listen to that and see how he, as he began to evolve and shape into what you're talking about, like the popular music versus mm -hmm. what would be like, you know, the popular maybe dance music versus like the concert music. Mm -hmm. There was a difference. And you see the way that he um, was shaping, um, basically looking at like song forms in the popular. And you see a lot of these as the lead sheets um, mm -hmm. that would become AABA. And then you'd see stuff, for example, the black, brown, and beige that he performed at um, Carnegie Hall in 1943. And not all critics enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were very... It's beautiful uh, stuff. I, I love it. And the oh. idea that um, he was taking that chance and maybe the band wasn't as well rehearsed because he was writing it right up to the... But he always did that, except this was his big concert. This was his um, kind of his tone poem, his tone mm -hmm. parallel to mm -hmm. um, lives of the, you know, the African-American, his people, and he was sharing it in a concert audience. Mm -hmm. And he, he took a lot of these chances and in some cases... Um, had to learn how to do that, but I think that piece um, helped set him up for what he would do later on with his suites. And a lot mm -hmm. of, I think, some of his um, great albums and collaborations continued with Billy Strayhorn. Um, but I, I think there was a different approach, and I think a lot of that can be actually dated back to the Cotton Club. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was put in this, had these limitations placed on him, and I think he began to realize, you know, I, I can do these other things, and I can... I can do arrangements and suites. So I can do arrangements of Tchaikovsky or even Rachmaninoff very early on, the C sharp mm -hmm. prelude, uh, C sharp minor prelude. Mm -hmm. But these types of ideas, I, I think he did approach it differently. And mm -hmm. he was considering different audiences in the music he was writing. Very, very interesting. Um, there's a lot has been written about Louis Armstrong's reaction to, to Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and all those people. And I was reading last week that Col Coleman Hawkins, on the other side of the equation, always kept up and ended up being as much of a personality, you know, very respected in the bebop community. Um, where, where did Duke fit into that when Charlie Parker and Diz and later on, I guess, Miles Davis, all those folks came along? I, you know, I think he was always, always aware and, and, and excited about how music was changing. And if you hear um, his, what was it, his, uh, his suite to uh, Newport, the jazz, uh, you know, the Newport Jazz Festival in 56, he performed mm -hmm. this, um, this suite. And, and you hear very clear bebop lines in this. And you hear, uh -huh. you hear early on, even with Cotton Tail, very bebop, um, very bebop ideas, using a lot mm -hmm. of um, extended harmonies over the chords um, in the melody having a, you know, sort of a fast up paced tempo where you're giving a soloist a chance to actually shine as opposed to just the ensemble all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, the fact mm -hmm. that he, he played and did an album with John Coltrane, he played, he did an album with um, Coleman Hawkins. Uh, the fact that he did the Money Jungle album with Charles Mingus and Max Roach, I think shows how much he was ready to embrace a new era of, of jazz. Mm -hmm. Musician. And, and they embraced him. They didn't, you know, because uh, Miles Davis never had kind things to say about Louis Armstrong until he died. And then he's, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, Miles Davis always criticized Armstrong's public persona. And then when he died, he said, no one's ever played anything on a trumpet that Louis Armstrong didn't play first. Right, right. <laughs> well, and Miles Davis criticized um, the Money Jungle album with, with, Ellington, Max Roach, and Mingus, too. He criticized, oh, these guys can't play together. This is horrible. See, you know. <laughs> and so that's fun. And that's a great, some great quotes because it, it can get you thinking about, well, you know, what, what, do they sound good together? You know, can you hear Ellington play like Ellington and mm. Max Roach play like Max Roach and Mingus? And can you put it together and, and have it work? Are they listening? And, and so I think it's fun to consider Miles, you know, perspectives on things and, and always... And you got to love someone who has, you know, has their opinions to say them and speak about it. Right, right. And a thought just came into my head and went right out, unfortunately. Wow. And as soon as, as soon as the interview ends, I'll remember it. <laughs> but the, you know, it's always the way. Um, the, um, 
I wanted to ask you whether there's anything anecdotal around Duke's, uh, Duke Ellington's appearance in Anatomy of a Murder. For those people who might not be aware, Anatomy of a Murder was a movie in the mid 50s uh, starring Jimmy Stewart, and it dealt with a rape, uh, just a rape, not a murder, and it was very, very, very um, forward in its dealing with evidence and it was very for the 1950s it was amazing and by the way the judge in the anatomy of murder was joseph walsh who was the um the guy who said at long what to mccarthy at long last or have you no shame that he was the judge in the movie um but duke ellington was in it in a kind of nightclub that they went to and it's a uh, very um fascinating it's a great movie do you know any, you know, have you run into any anecdotes about that or anything? Well, about his appearance on the set. Um, yeah, and the whole thing. It's just... Well, you know, the, the, I, I have read that actually the American Bar Association considers that film and, and they've actually, they, they will use it in law schools or have used it in law schools talking about some of the legal process. Um, right. And this was, you know, there was controversy and they were saying things in a movie um, yeah, like underwear, women's underwear. I mean, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. And the interesting part is he actually won, Ellington won three Grammy Awards for this. Grammy Award. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a famous picture of him holding all of them, you know, sort of crunched yeah. up and he's smiling. Right. But the fascinating part to me is that, you know, jazz had been always used to depict, you know, um, big cities, late night, you know, maybe a, this right yeah this darker element or maybe this Threat, sort of, threatening right yeah, threatening possibly and here we are mm -hmm. what in michigan is where the movie takes right. place right jimmy stewart and he'll be driving down a country road and you hear this great big bands like right. jazz orchestras sounds of a rhythm and and trumpets and and reeds and um and really hip harmonic language right. at the time which mm -hmm which had, had even, he, you know, been pushing and evolving into what people would be considering like modern jazz by that time. Right. So it's, I told you before we started, um, you know, before we actually started the interview that my father was an attorney and he swore by that movie. You know, it was just, it was a great, anyone out there, I mean, check it out both for Duke and the music and, and the movie itself. And watch it, I gotta say, just watch it through to the very, very end of the credits because you'll hear Cad Anderson play these ridiculously high screams on the trumpet at the very end of the credits. And I remember hearing that when I was younger, like, oh my gosh, mom, what is that? Mom, what instrument is that? You know, and I'm a trauma player, so ending up, you know, I, I can't play those notes, but Cad Anderson was, was very rare. Uh, but yeah, watch it through to the end. It's, it's great. There are people who are specialists in high register, right? The people who just do the high stuff. That's it. And even that, even that, because I'm a lead trumpet player and I can't play those notes. But right. even, even with that, it's he was even as a lead trumpet player up, you know, up in the high highest ranks. I think it's like it, unbelievable. Um, Jeff, uh, just to finish off. If you, this is the last question, again, it's an over, overview kind of question. If you met someone who never heard of Duke Ellington, if that's possible, and they ask you, what would, what would you say, you know? Or what, let me ask you this, what would you tell them to listen to? Mm. If, if, you know, that's a better question. What, what, if two or three Duke Ellington pieces, what would you suggest to them? Well, I, you know, I think a good example for someone who doesn't know about Ellington would be to look at Mood Indigo, maybe one of his earliest hits, okay. and a piece that he sustained in longevity through his entire career and had bands playing every night, where um, even if just on YouTube or looking at the elements of Mood Indigo, typing it in and seeing how much that piece has evolved, and from the very early 1930 version, all the way through into the 60s, where he's playing double time tempo versions with Paul Gonzalez taking a, a longer, more extended solo, which was what would have been done in the 60s, but right. would have never been done earlier. 
and to hear even along the way where you begin to hear, um, I think it's Willie Cook on trumpet on one of the recordings where um, you hear him playing a solo over Mood Indigo with, with the bebop language and you can hear that that's what's going on. And each arrangement has changed. And in some cases, as he was often known to do, almost like a recomposition. The form mm -hmm. is changing, he's inserting more solos, adding an intro, adding an end. But for someone who doesn't know Ellington, I would probably give them about three or four different versions of the mm -hmm. same piece to listen to so they can understand how Ellington evolved and changed. And he wasn't just stuck in, in 1930 or stuck in his cotton club, but he was always, always looking, um, you know, looking into other sources and always changing and adapting. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I'd like to thank you very much. Again, we've been talking about Duke Ellington and um, some other things as well with Jeff Clawson. Jeff is an associate professor of harmony at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And uh, Jeff, I'd like to just thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much, Carl. This was a pleasure. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you.